Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome everyone to the Maryland Complete Count Committee. It is a pleasure and my honor to be part of this. I wanted to thank all of the members um, for your time, for your talents, which will be needed um, to assist the entire reach of the board and beyond um, to successfully count every one um, of the Marylanders in the 2020 decennial census. This is important body. These important bodies was formed by the governor Hogan and with the support of the Maryland House of Delegates, Maryland Senate, the Maryland Association of Counties, and the Maryland Municipal League. Maryland census efforts already have historic bipartisan support from the state to make sure that everyone is counted and have established a solid partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau that is already benefiting the state. We are so excited. We mean it. We are so excited. <laughs> Come on, guys. We're excited. <laughs> to start this new journey, uh, which is going to start today. We look forward to working with each and every one of you and all of the counties, the city, the town, the neighborhoods, to communicate the, important, the importance of the census and to make sure everyone fills out and submit their census forms. With that, I want to turn it over to my friend and my sister. She was born in the morning. I was born in the evening. So <laughs> my friend, uh, Kosher Lily Castillo. Thank you. How are you, everybody? Thank you, Wakiri, and thank you to all of you. Our job is to come together to get everyone in Maryland to know they count and they need to be counted by developing the implementation and outreach plan that builds partnership through the state. We need to constantly communicate how the census is critical to our families, our neighbors, and our communities. And we begin our work just as the 2020 census grant program cannot complete its own, providing more than 4 million to support census outreach efforts from local government and municipalities. I'd like to turn it over to Maryland Department of Planning Secretary, Secretary Rob McCord to tell us a little bit about the 2020 Census Grant Program. Thank you, Ms. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I really um, am excited. I'm very excited that we have a group that's focused on getting this count done accurately and completely. Um, Census is hosted in planning with a liaison to the U.S. Census. And census is used for many, many things, as you may know. It's business planning, healthcare planning, emergency planning. So having it reside in planning is not an unusual thing. Um, we need to make sure that we're accurately counting each one of our neighborhoods, each one of our communities. That reflection of the accuracy of each community helps all of the processes for which people depend on the census, that business planning, the healthcare planning, emergency planning, the, the distribution of billions of dollars of federal funding based on the number of people and who they are to reflecting each community accurately. That is our commitment to make sure that we count everyone that can possibly be counted in Maryland. Um, we, I, I, I finished my service, um, my service is not finished actually, on the, uh, on the uh, census grants panel. The census grants panel examined about 40 applications for funding. Um, we funded a little more than $4 million worth of, of grants to support outreach efforts throughout the state. Outreach efforts that um, some of us on the panel probably could not have thought of. Other situations that we make sure that trusted voices are reaching out to make sure that everyone understands that this is a very important effort and that your participation is what makes it effective. Your participation Reflecting your community is what's critical to the success of the census program. Um, it will, the, the grants panel, as a panel, made a recommendation that any of the funding that is residual, that either is left over from the awards or cannot be spent, gets uh, um, reallocated towards the complete count committee. So we will have residual funding available to us also. But I want to make sure that everybody is as focused on making sure we get a complete count, that we get an accurate count, and that people are making sure
sure that we understand the value of the census, the, the, the personal and communal value of the census. It's an extremely important process. It happens every 10 years, of course. It doesn't always coincide with elections. It doesn't always coincide with leap years. But it does coincide with the leap year this time. So we will have one extra day. And my message is make it count. That's right. yeah. We will make it count. So thank you. So Ethan Markford, thank you for your work on the grand panel and all your fellow members. And we are so grateful for them as well. Governor Hogan, Senate President Miller, and House Speaker Bush for their support on the Maryland Census, but doing the work of the 2020 Census Grand Panel through this funding. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to the United States Census Bureau. No. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Before we begin, if you don't mind, can we introduce everyone who's sitting around the table? For those who are sitting in the audience, who are uh, knows here. And after that, I would like to have uh, the partnership specialist team for the bureau introduce, introduce themselves. Uh, good morning. My name is Steve McAdams. I'm the executive director of the governor's office of community initiatives. Good morning. I'm not Lourdes Padilla, secretary of the Department of uh, Human Services. Uh, I am David Lee, and I'm Deputy Secretary there and representing the department. I'm Audra Harrison. I'm the director for the Maryland Census with the Department of Planning. Good morning, Wal Kidia I'm the co chair and also um, the Secretary Director for Centro de Apoyo Familiar, or Senior for Assistance Department. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Castillo. I'm the other co chair, and as well, I'm the President and CEO of Workforce Management Group at Hispanos and Fronteras to help business developments in the state of Maryland. And I'm Rob McCord, the Secretary for Public Planning. Randall Nixon, Associate Director of the Census. And I'm Annalisa Russell, the Assistant Regional Census Manager, participating in all things 2020 for the State of Maryland. I'm Debbie Lichter, Federal Liaison with the Maryland State Department of Education, representing the State Superintendent of Schools. I'm Christine Griffin, I am not Senator Washington. From the city of Patriotsburg, representing the Maryland Police Department. I'm Chief Operating Chief of Staff, Baltimore County Executive, and I'm Janelle Wilkins, House of Delegates, District 20. Thank you. Here's what I am. Partnership Specialist, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Lauren Mears, and I work with one of the Partnership Specialists on the Department. Good morning. I'm And I ask you to please remember their names and brand their faces <laughs> in your mind because those are the, your resource people. Those are your contact, local contact. Those are the individuals who will be helping you every step of the way. And the moment that they don't, I'll leave you with my phone number and my email address so you can stay in touch with me. Since Mr. Minor wants to hold me accountable for the presentation today, he said he wanted to make sure I had the right slides and that I'm presenting it the right way, even though he didn't produce it, I had to produce it, but he's holding me accountable for that. Again, my name is Ron Brown, I'm partnership coordinator with the United States Census Bureau out of the Philadelphia region. Even though I'm based in Richmond, Virginia, I get a lot of my direction from the Philadelphia office, which covers eight states and the District of Columbia. Those are the eight states being Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And I'm subject to being in any one of those different states. I have been. I'm trying to slow down. I'm glad that Elisa is now uh, Assistant Regional Census Manager for the Baltimore area, then maybe I won't have to be there as many times as I've been in the past. But what I'm going to be sharing with you today is talking about the census give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history. I also share with you roles and responsibilities for this committee, and I hope I don't scare any of you away. I want to thank the, <clears throat> the Attorney General for being with us today. Thank you for joining us, sir. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. And thank you each for being here. I'm sure Audrey didn't tell you what you've gotten yourself into, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Because <laughs> we at the Census Bureau, I think we're still having a lot of fun. What are we doing? This is a benchmark day. 
one year away from Census Day 2020, where we have to count everyone. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter where they reside, whether they have a home or not, we have to count everyone. And we need your help in doing that. We have to hire over a half a million people to help us count everyone, to help us understand which houses, which individuals we need to get for. And I have to share with you up front, we're having difficulty finding enough candidates. You know, the unemployment rate is pretty low. And then some of our jobs don't stop for a couple of months. And people need jobs now. But we need your help. We still need to find individuals to help us get the word out about the census. I'm going to talk about why it's important. Some of you may know. I'm going to share with you why it's safe and confidential. Confidential. Because people in the community need to know that. You are the trusted voices and familiar faces for the state of Maryland. And we're counting on that. You have to help us carry the message. You have to tell us where we need to be because we just don't know. We don't know who we're supposed to be speaking to to make sure we're getting the message out. We don't know who we're supposed to be educating entirely. And we need your help in doing that. We need to be able to get some guidance on if the strategies we have in place are the right ones. Because they may not be. But you know Maryland. And you have to tell us, yes, I'm based in Richmond, Virginia. My coming to Maryland as often as I have, people don't know me. Audra does. Whenever I get a phone call from Audra, I make sure whatever she tells me to do, I do it. She can be a little pushy sometimes. <laughs> but that's a good thing. That's the determination we're looking for from others within the state of Maryland to make sure we're counting everybody. So I'm going to take you through a presentation. As you keep your eyes and focus on the screens with what I'm sharing with you. I'm going to ask you to please try to hold your questions to the end. Because I want to get the specialists up here to answer your questions. I'm going to leave. No, no, I'm not going to do that to them. But we want to be able to answer your questions, but again, we want to be able to take you through this. This is my third assembly. I'm also retiring after this. <laughs> on the call with it day. But I enjoy it because of the impact it has on our communities and each and every single one of us. And we need to make sure we're sharing with people the impact. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Basic ground rules, you already know that. Keep your cell phones on vibrate or turn them off. I say turn them off because I don't know what vibrating does to some people. So I don't ask them to turn them off. But just take turns talking and ask questions. You have something you want to share with us. And I'm going to be asking you things to make some comments to share with us. So others will get to know why you think this is important. You're also going to be getting information, a complete count committee guidebook. What I'm going to be sharing, some of the stuff I'm going to be sharing with you today is in the guidebook, but it's going to help you as you move forward to talk about what it takes to be a complete count committee, what it takes to even develop subcommittees as part of this complete count committee. You're not going to be able to do it all by yourself. I guarantee you that. So you're going to need to get other individuals from around the state to help you do that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Overview of CCC. CCCs are one of the most important things we engage in happening since 2000. Complete count committees. Again, they are task force set up by the governor, set up by higher elected officials and communities to come together and speak about what needs to be done within that specific community. They know their community, they know their neighbors, they know the difficulty of reaching out to people and getting them to do things. So you have to tell us what can we do to help you to educate them, to encourage them, to get them excited about wanting to fill out the census forms. Again, it's a task force. And I'm glad this task force is starting today, April 1st, one year out. Most people on their mind today, April 1st, April Fool's Day. <laughs> this is no joke to us. <laughs> we are very serious. And next year, April 1st, 2020, is Census Day. Same thing. People are going to wonder if it's a joke. This is not a joke. It's too important to them. It's too important to the communities and too important to the country. But if we count committees, we've asked high selected officials to establish them. Great first step. Just the beginning of it. We have a lot of work cut out for you. And not only dealing with government-led complete count committees, we ask community-based organizations to do the same thing. We ask faith-based organizations to do the same thing, establish complete count committees. 
those organizations should be represented on this complete count commission also. Those are segments of the population that will be out there engaging the community. I am a former pastor, and I know how people go to their faith leader looking for directions and answers about what they need to do. I stopped pastoring in terms of having a church about five years ago, but I still have members of that church calling me, asking me questions, looking for guidance, looking for directions. That's why we engage the faith leaders, because we know people will go to them first before they come to us. Some of them even before they come to you. They will ask their faith leaders, should I be doing this and why? So we engage them. We engage education. Education is critical. Children are the most undercounted, especially children under five, the most undercounted population whenever we do a dissenting. We don't know why parents are not putting them on the census form. I've asked parents, what is it? When you were filling out the census form, did they get on your nerve and you say, well, I'll get back at you. I won't include you. But those are dollars that are being missed. Do the parents understand that? Or if the child is born April 2nd and the parent hasn't filled out the census form, they can still include them on the census form. And we're trying to get parents to understand that. So we go into the school system. We bring information into teachers and administrators to talk about the 2020 census. To also talk about information they can include in their curriculums to help educate kids. Kids will go home, they'll latch on to this, and they'll go, Mom, Dad, Grandpa, you got to do this. You have to do this. And they'll stay on them until they get it done. They're our biggest market is sales people. That's why we go into the school system, but to make sure that they are being counted. It's important. So we engage education. We engage community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. It's critical, but we engage you even more because you're the ones who have to share that message for us. But that's what a complete count committee is about. Background and structure of complete count committee. There can be a tribal state and local governments. I am also the point of contact in the Philadelphia region for tribal contacts and governments. They are sovereign governments, entities. We work with them like we're working for the U.S. Census Bureau. We cannot go onto their land without speaking to them and getting approved first. And they're doing complete count committees. But they understand how important it is that their tribal members are counted. And not just where their lands happen to be. It could be urban tribal members all across this country that they're reaching out to to make sure they're counted. So they get credit for, for belonging to that particular tribe. The local governments, yes, we work with them, <clears throat> and we develop partnerships, just like we're doing with you today. You know, but we also work throughout the communities. We're asking superintendents and schools to develop complete count committees, and we need your help in reaching superintendents, because I can assure you we have not reached all of the superintendents in Maryland, and we need to. Whether it's getting to the Secretary of Education or whoever we need to reach out to, we need to make contact and make sure we're speaking to them about the importance of the 2020 census. Yes, government, media. What I need to share with you is that this decennial is going to be unlike any decennial we've ever done before. We're doing social media this time. We've never done social media before. We don't know how to do social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yes, I have a millennial on my team who keeps talking about Twitter. But the Census Bureau really doesn't know how to do that. We didn't do it in 2010. So we're engaging in that now to understand that. We have a lot of learning, especially in a short period of time. One year. We have a group, I think it's in Baltimore, and you can correct me, Julius, if I'm wrong, that are doing a Twitter chat with millennials today. One year out. First time we've done, done something like that. But we're going to continue. They're excited to be a partner of ours. But we have to engage social media, and we don't really know how to. We're going to be working with workforce development agencies. Why? As I mentioned, we have to hire over a half a million people to do this assembly. And it is different. We're in a different age. We no longer use pen and paper for applications for people to get jobs. Anyone who wants to work for the Census Bureau has to do it online, has to apply online, has to be considered online. If they don't use that technology, they will never be considered for any of the positions we have. 
And I'll leave you at the end of this with the websites we suggest people go to. So we've got to work with development agencies, employment agencies, not those that charge a fee, those that are free, to help people apply for jobs. We've sent our recruiting team out to have job fairs, career fairs, walking people through the application process. One of the places they can go to is USA Job. Now, I don't know if any of you have applied for anything on USA Job. That can be long, tedious, and very difficult. But we walk people through the process and help them apply. But that's the way we're doing it. No longer pen and paper for anyone. So we're working with workforce development agencies because, of, again, we're using electronic, the technology, to be able to help people apply for jobs. And we're going to, again, also need to use them as people are looking to fill out their census forms to be able to do it online. We're hoping minimally 40% of the people will fill out their census form online. Cost effective doing it that way. We don't have to hire a workforce to send them out, not in doors. But we will send them out. For those homes that do not respond online or by telephone, we're going to have someone knock on the door. And do you need help filling out the census form? So those are some of the things we have to be able to do. We're working with businesses, Chamber of Commerce. You know, Julius and I met with the Chamber of Commerce CEO in Towson about six months ago to talk about what we need to do. Also, the Chamber of Commerce in Baltimore, City of Baltimore. But there are others we have not reached out to, and we need to. Business is very important. Part of the census information that is out there, businesses use to determine where they're going to locate a business. They want to know that there's income in that community to support that business. They want to know they have enough people living in that community that can fill the job they may have. So they use our data for that. So those are some of the other groups, and that should be part of the structure you have. Faith based, I've already talked about that. Why do we take the census? Mandated by the Constitution. Every 10 years, we have to do a descendant. Count everyone in this country. Everyone. Mandated by the Constitution. So we do it. And we're going to continue to do it. By December 31st, 2020, we have to put the numbers on how this population in this country has changed on the president's desk. So he can know. And that's just it. Only numbers. We put out aggregate numbers. We do not put out anyone personal identifiable information. And I will talk a little bit more about why we do it that way. But again, by December 31st, we have to give that information to the president. By the end of the first quarter in 2021, we have to release it to state legislators and governors so they can look at it for redistricting purposes, so they can look at it in terms of where they need to build schools, hospitals, and they can see what else they need to do as a result of how populations have changed. Then by the end of the second quarter in 2021, we released it to the general public. So individuals can see how their communities have changed and what's happening in their community. But we have to deliver them to the president by December 31st at the latest, but constitutional mandate. Why? A number of different reasons. A couple I'd like to talk about is apportionment. Who sits in Congress is by dependent on population numbers in the states. How many seats each state get is based on that population. But probably the biggest and most important reason I like to talk about is there will be $675 billion annually redistributed back into communities based on the census count. You know, and as working with the census director here, we, she's even broken it down for us. The state of Maryland will lose up to $2,000 per person for everyone not counted. You take a look at that. And that's just for one year. You look at over a 10 year period of time because it's not going to change until 2030 when we do another decennial. So for every person missed in 2020, that represents up to $2,000, $20,000 over a 10-year period of time. And the participation rate for Maryland back in from 2000 to 2010 was 
It didn't change. It stayed the same. That's not good. It shouldn't stay the same. It should go up. So we have to think about why did it stay the same? Why was there no improvement from 2000 to 2010? What do we need to do to make sure people are getting the message and being counted? 26% of the population in Maryland were missed. You do the math. Talk about how much money was missed. But we're doing this because we want to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And because of its impact on apportionment and funding for communities. This is the census design. If you look up in the lower left-hand corner, we have to identify where to count. So we work closely with planning departments on the state level and on the local level for them to tell us the addresses they have and if the addresses we have were correct. Anna Lisa was the head of our geography department working closely with local governments and state governments in a program called LUCA, Local Update of Census Addresses. We asked localities to take a look at our files, to update them, because in 10 years, we all know there were new subdivisions built all over the place. And there were some places that became vacant. So we need that information to know where to send the census form so people can be counted. So we had the LUCA program, working with planning departments to get that information. Then, if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, motivate people to respond. How do we encourage people to respond? What do we need to say to them to respond? We need to tell them that they represent funds for their community, for their children in school, because it does impact school. Free lunches, reduced lunches, Free breakfast, reduced breakfast, books. All of that is impacted by census dollars. And the more money you have coming back, the more it can help. When a lot of people are asking now, okay, you want me to fill out the census form, what's in it for me? That's what's in this for them. Money for their community, money for their children in school. But have they gotten the message? There's a lot of fear out there. And I talked about that in the end. But we have to motivate people. Now, let me let me change that. You have to motivate people to respond. We will be right there supporting you, but you're the familiar faces and voices for Maryland. So you have to get the message out there, and we'll help you do that. We'll show you the programs we're putting in place for that to happen, but you have to do it. Then the upper right hand corner. Census Day, we count the population, April 1st, 2020. However, the middle of March 2020, we will let people know they can go online and begin to fill out their census form. We will send them reminder notices that they can do that. So that the middle of March, they can do that online. Then April 1st, others will be able to call or get a questionnaire and mail it back. So we're gonna have the three ways that we're gonna be announcing. We're gonna notify people before we start sending them reminder notices that they can get involved. But April 1st, 2020 is Census Day. You're gonna find out a lot of events going on, especially by this committee in the state of Maryland to announce April 1st, 2020. We thank you for helping us announcing April 19th, I mean April 1st, 2019, but as we move towards April 1st, 2020, you need to do more. Think about something for each and every single one. Think about all of the things that go on in the state of Maryland. The events, especially as the warm weather is breaking. How can we get the message out there? So April 1st, we count. Then again, as I mentioned, lower right-hand corner, releasing the data, the numbers to the president. So he sees that a population has changed and then in 2021, releasing the rest of the information. This is what I call our decennial challenge. Some of the things we have to deal with. I've already mentioned one of them is that we're no longer in an age of pen and paper. Everything is done electronically, everything. We're in an information explosion age. At the touch of a button, you can get information. You can ask Google to search out something for you. You can ask Alexa, at home, search out something for you. 
There are so many different ways you can get information instantly. And you get it that way. So we're in an information explosion. If you, I don't know, if you haven't heard this before or seen it, there's a major distrust of government, especially on the federal level. I go to meetings to talk about the census. I tell people I work for the federal government. There's a mass exodus for the exit. Until I tell them, hey, are you interested in the $675 billion we, that will be redistributed back in the community? They all stop, turn around, and take a seat. And we have a candid conversation. And I let them know it's not about me, it's about you. You have to get the message out. But there's a major distrust of government. I don't know why. But there's a major distrust. We also have to deal with increasingly a diverse communities, populations, changing, growth, immigration occurring. Different people that don't always look like each of us. That are still helping our country grow in numbers. We're also in an age of mobile population, people moving here and there. And I have two millennials in my household. Well, in my pocket, really, because you never see them. <laughs> my son, who was an expiring actor, in the past seven, eight years, has been in seven different locations. Twice in Richmond, Virginia. Twice in Washington. Once in Hollywood, California, I had to make him come home quickly from Hollywood because it was very costly him trying to get a career out there. <laughs> now he lives in New York. And I thought he was out of my pocket because he was getting these great commercials and great jobs, but I'm still paying his rent in New York. <laughs> and he said, only for a year, it's been a year and a half now. I'm trying to figure out how to get him out of my pocket. Then my daughter, who I love dearly, I love my son, but I love my daughter dearly, his father. She was doing great. After getting two master's degrees over in London, came back home, wanted to have a career here. Moved back into Richmond, where I'm from, my wife. Had her own apartment. Great job. Doing real well. Decided one day she came and said, Dad, I think I'm going to move back home. I said, why? Well, I want to be closer to you and Mom. She said, you're only 15 minutes away. How much more closer do you want to be? See, we were empty nesters. So I said, no, Dad, I just want to be closer to you and Mom. I said, no, there's another reason for it. What's going on? Talk to your father. Well, Dad, I'm thinking about saving my money, buying a house, and renting it out. I said, OK, but I can tell you who your first renters are going to be. It's going to be your parents, and we're not going to pay rent. <laughs> she looked at me. I know you're kidding, Dad. I said, try it. Get your house. Let's see what happens. But the millennials, too. She's been in, she was in London for 10 years. A couple just because she liked being there. Then a few others because she wanted to get her master's degrees. Got two of them. And then came back home. But they like to travel. Mobile population, constantly moving. Those are some of the challenges we're facing. People moving. When we do this to Samuel County on April 1st, we're wondering if the snowbirds are going to be back home or they're still going to be in their warm weather areas. We're looking at migrant workers. Where are they going to be when we do this census count? Because it's right at the time when the weather is breaking, but we know how fickle weather can be. It can still be cold, and they may not be in Maryland or Virginia and some of these other places where we need to count. Those are some of the challenges we're facing. We need to know who the immigration attorneys are that we can talk to because they're helping people become legal immigrants here. Because we still need to reach out to them, whether they're documented or undocumented, we're counting everyone. They're using services in our communities. We have to count them. But that's the challenges we're facing. And the biggest one, unfortunately, is again that distrust in government. And we have to overcome that. We need your help in overcoming that. How are census data used? I've talked about education, I've spoken about business. Faith-based leaders are using the data to see if there are new members moving into their service area so they can recruit them. They can get them into their membership. There are different ways this information is being used. Yeah, I, I mentioned I'm from Richmond, Virginia. In between the Centennial, this being my third one, I was an administrator at a middle school in Virginia. 
And as I was working there, we found out that Walmart was building a store across the street from the school. Our biggest challenge was how are we going to keep kids in school and not over at Walmart playing the video games? But Walmart used data to make sure there was enough income in that community to build the store and they would have a workforce. And they've been there for two years and thriving. I drive by that Walmart parking lot every single day and it is packed. There's no place to park in there and they are thriving. But they use sensitive data to be determined where they need to build that store. That's how different organizations are using information, the sensitive data. Public transportation, a lot of people use public transportation. Roadways. I hate coming up to Northern Virginia to DC because it seems though they never stop doing construction on the road work. I'm trying to figure out when are they going to ever get it fixed? I'm glad I purchased Easy Pass. I can bypass some of that stuff. But they're always doing some type of work. Federal dollars go into the Department of Transportation to do that work. As I'm running, running by <laughs> MGM, Oxen Hills, they're doing some construction there. I'm trying to figure out when they're going to stop doing that because I drive every place I go. And when I go to Philadelphia for our meetings, I have to go past there. I got a speeding ticket one night. Didn't realize it until they sent me the, the citation with a picture of my car. <laughs> so I, I, made, I, I found out how they did it. A truck on the side of the road with a mounted camera on it, taking pictures of speeders. And they say, the fault, they're going to, it's a photo. I never speed through there again. I don't speed through many other places, but definitely not there. But they're still doing construction there. Federal dollars going to that. Even more, federal dollars go into SNAP programs. And federal dollars go into education. Head Start, Pre-K. Those are where dollars go. That's how that $675 billion is being used. What does it mean for Maryland? Approximately $1,800 per person who is missed. Can the state afford to lose that type of money? How important it is, is it to the constituents of Maryland? The census is confidential. I have to speak a lot on the confidentiality and privacy. We do not share information with anyone. The IRS, ICE, local law enforcement, Social Services Department. We do not. We can't. By law. Title 13. We as Census Bureau employees had to take an oath that says if we violate that law, we're subject to spend five years in jail and or pay a $250,000 fine. My wife has told me that $250,000 is for our retirement and I only have five years to give to her so I don't even think about breaking that law. But on top of it, I can't even tell her things I see as it relates to personal identifiable information. She asks me every day I come home, how was your day? I say, great. And that's all I say. Because there's very little I can actually share with her. Because this material is confidential and we are bound by the oath we take. And not just while I am employed with the U.S. Census Bureau. That's for the rest of my life, whether I'm working for anyone. I cannot tell anyone anything about what I've seen with the U.S. Census Bureau. I can see domestic abuse, child abuse. And that, that was a conflict because as an educator, if I saw child abuse, I had to report it. Could, I couldn't get away from it. But with the Bureau, if I see something like that, I can't utter a word. And when I first started working with the Bureau in 1999, that was a moral conflict for me but I'm still working for them, and we resolved that. Other things I've had to deal and fight with the Census Bureau about, the $675 billion distribution. In 2000, when I first started working with the Bureau, I was complaining, I said, you guys are gonna be sending money to Pennsylvania where my son was going to school. 
No, I want some of that money coming into Virginia. I'm sending it enough to Pennsylvania. They said, no. I said, what do you mean? I want money back. They said, you don't understand. That's part of our group orders program. Your son going to school in college in Pennsylvania is utilizing services there. Is utilizing road, roadway there. So the money needs to go there. I was happy they said that. Because a year after that decennial count, my son had an emergency appendectomy. His appendix had ruptured in his college dorm room. Poison was spreading through his body. And if they didn't get him to the emergency room in time, he could have died. And I realized money is federal dollars were going to that hospital to be able to help out. So I stopped fighting about getting money back into Virginia. But we still have parents who will count their children at home. And we're asking them not to. We're working closely with colleges and universities to count the students who are on campus. The biggest problem you need to know is, uh, is the students off campus. How do we get them counted? How do we ensure every student living in an apartment, whether it's two, three, four, are counted on that census form that that address will receive? We need to make sure we're getting that message out too. We count prisons, working closely with the administrators of prison school board. We do things like that. That impacts this descendant. But again, that's the confidentiality. You need to be able to get that message out about confidentiality and privacy, how no one shares their information outside of the Census Bureau. How when we get the information, it gets encrypted so that only numbers come out, not names. Not addresses. We don't collect social security numbers on these forms. It doesn't happen. And we'll be able to get to you, whether it's through Audra and Randall. Our partnership team will be able to get you those fact sheets that talk about confidentiality and privacy that we can get out to people. Because I've asked that quite a bit. That's one of the biggest fears that we're going to violate the confidentiality and privacy. That we're going to tell them how many people may be leaving, living in a, an apartment. And it may be more than what's supposed to be, depending on what the lease says. They have fear we're going to be sharing their information. So it's important we talk about confidentiality. What are the three count committees? Can a task force of individuals who know the community and the state better than we do, telling us what you're going to be doing so we can support you in those endeavors? A diverse group of individuals who know their community and neighbors and family members well and can help us get the word out. There are tribal and government CCCs and community based CCCs. When should you organize a CCC? Really, it should have been yesterday. We have some groups that started about a year ago. I'm glad to see you here. This is the first step. But I'm going to share with you, you have your work cut out for you. One year to go. We're going to help you make it as easy as possible, but one year to go. So that's why I say now, today is a great day. They're already talking about you, Census Bureau headquarters and other places. Because this being a kickoff for us, April 1st, one year out, we told them you guys are doing this. You may see some media about you. We're having a meeting at the National Press Club in D.C. to announce one year out activities. You're going to be known all over the country because you did this. Thank you. Thank you. You can give yourself a little applause. <laughs> You've done a great day. But now the work begins. Before I go into substructure, subcommittee structure, how about we take a break for lunch? We'll make this a little bit of a working lunch. So if you don't mind, while you still have food in your mouth, and uh, yeah, thank uh, the governor, thank our judge for feeding you. We we'll won't give you this information, at least we give you the real food also. I would like to continue because again, our goal is to have you out here between 1 15 and 1 30.
Again, key instructions about CCC. They should be all inclusive. I understand the Census Bureau staff, partnership specialists, and myself, we only serve as a resource. And Elisa, she'll serve as a resource. She will be definitely in touch with you about the operations side, how we're looking to not only recruit people, but address listeners, those who are actually going out, checking the addresses we have questions about as we're moving into the enumeration where we have to send people out to knock on doors for those homes that either need a census form or haven't returned them. She's going to be heading up from our Baltimore area, even though she before works out of Philadelphia, she's responsible for the Baltimore lane. And as we break, she'll be able to talk more about what that means and how it impacts you. There are a lot of communities, a lot of areas within Maryland that she's going to be responsible for the whole census operation. So you need to also brand her face, get her card or get her number and her email address because she'll be able to really walk you through that process of how we're hiring those people to work in the field. Now we're looking to hire uh, as we're opening up uh, area census offices. I will show you where we'll be opening up some of the area census offices in Maryland. She is going to be responsible for a lot of that. We have to have anywhere from 30 to 40 people within these offices are going to be responsible for supervising the field people. Field people will never have to report to the office, but they're still going to get supervision. As I already mentioned, technology is the key. They're going to have smartphones, they're going to have tablets, they're going to have laptops. The only way they'll really be communicating with the office and getting their assignments is electronically. But again, Annalisa will be able to talk to you about that uh, as we break, and also because she is She's heading all of that up here in Maryland. Just some recommended subcommittees. You have to determine what subcommittees you want to have. But these are some of the recommended ones. A recruitment subcommittee. We talk about recruitment, and we are recruiting for the position, people for the positions we have to fill. We need your help. Where should we be? Yes, we are working with workforce development agencies, but are there other places, community-based agencies that we need to reach out to that we may not be aware of? Yes, we're working with churches, but who else should we be contacting? And as we're doing this recruitment, one of the key things we need is places where people can go online, on a computer, to fill out applications. So we need your help in identifying that. So yes, while we're doing all of this recruiting, we need to know who we should be speaking to in community. Every single day I get notices from the Philadelphia Regional Office Center Center or headquarters about jobs that we're posting for. And we just did a recruiting for uh, a partnership coordinator in the Baltimore area, someone who'd be doing similar things that I do. But we need your help to find out where to go for some of these other positions. And before I continue, I have two individuals I need to introduce you to that I missed uh, in the beginning. Kevin? Hi. Just introduce yourself. Oh, I'm the uh, Maryland Census Outreach Coordinator. And Lee? Do you know who's part of this Tell them where you're from. What area? Yeah, I was very young from uh, Calvert County. Uh, we currently have about six partnership specialists on in Maryland, and we're looking to get to 20. So as we are posting for these positions, and some of them will be in language, some of them will be with specific, specific skill sets, but we need your help even in finding them. So again, in all areas, we need your help as it relates to recruiting. Government, well, we got a bunch of government people around and say, well, I don't think we need to really do anything except for set up a subcommittee for government. Education, having superintendents, having the secretary of education, someone on this committee or a subcommittee that's going to focus on education, making sure we get the word out. One of the things that happened when I was working in 2000 with the census in Bristol, Virginia, they took the census form committee of teachers took the census forms and compared it to the standards of learning test that students had to take in Virginia every year. Found out that the information on the census form closely mirrored a lot of what was being taught in the school system and was able to use that in preparing students for the standard of learning test. It hasn't been done since 
2000. I'm looking for a state, a community that's willing to try to do the same thing. Does anyone know who the first census director was? Thomas Jefferson. And even then, 1790, they had an undercount. And they were going around on horseback and walking. We have no excuse with the technology and transportation to have an undercount, but we do. And it's not because we don't have the tools available, it's because of how people are embracing filling out their census form or not. But again, having an education subcommittee, a media subcommittee, we have engaged a national media contractor to help us by preparing some of our messages. Those messages may not start coming out until October, November, because we engaged them late in the process. But they're doing some major work for us. They're helping us put out more fact sheets, fact sheets in language. We currently have one that talks about confidentiality in Spanish. We're going to be giving more. The questionnaire will be out in Spanish. We will have information in 13 languages, including English. We will also have a guide out there in 50 to more languages that will assist people filling out their census form. One of the reasons we're in school, in some cases, we recognize that students in their households may be the only bilingual person who need to help their parents fill out the census form. So making that part of your education committee that they're addressing that particular need is important. But these are, again, just suggestions. You should have, unquestionably, a faith-based subcommittee. Community-based nonprofits. I was fortunate a couple of weeks ago to be with our group in a meeting in Baltimore City for nonprofits, CEOs, executive directors. And some of the information that was being shared with them was painting a picture of gloom and doom because they weren't getting all of the information. I am grateful for this lady because she stood up and she really let them have it. Painting a picture of doom and gloom and not sharing with them how much money was being missed because people were not being counted and how they were not sharing all of the information and how they were painting a picture of it being totally bleak. But after she stood up, and they gave me an opportunity to say something. Everybody was gravitating to the two of us to learn more about the importance of the census, not the doom and gloom picture that some people were trying to portray. And you will have that out there. People will ask you about citizenship. We don't talk about that because that has not been addressed. It's in the courts. The courts will deal with it. As far as we're concerned, we're going to count everyone. The Constitution says we are mandated to count everyone who lives here, documented and undocumented, and that's what we are going to do. But there will be people painting that, that dark picture that you need to help us overcome. People need to hear all the story, not just part of it. So those are just, again, recommended subcommittees. What do they do? If you look at the recruitment subcommittee, as I mentioned, distributing recruitment materials, we will get that to you. They will have information on how people can go to 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. 2020census.gov forward slash jobs for people who are interested in working in the field. That information is there. I mentioned earlier about people being able to go to USA Job and apply for more of the management positions or the partnership specialist positions or some of the other positions that are in the Census Bureau. And let me just share with you, even though we, in partnership, will be gone after September 2020, our time ends, we have another side of the house that does surveys year in, year out. Hospitalization surveys, crime victimization surveys, American Community Survey, Economic Census Survey. They're there every year. So the Bureau doesn't go away, the decennial is done. It's only done every 10 years. And yet, within that 10th year, it is the largest mobilization of a peacetime workforce that is ever done in this country when we do a decennial. Uh, more people than ever happens at any one time. But we also do other service. So while some of us go and retire, and some of us look for other jobs, 
You know, there's another side of the bureau that does exist doing service. But it's important in Yang to look at what the roles of subcommittees will be involved in. As I mentioned, recruitment is involved with recruitment. Government is involved with reaching out to government entities. And there are a lot of them that have developed complete counties on the local level. One of the things I strongly recommend whenever you're meeting, invite the chairs of those committees to come to your meeting. You're going to set the model. You're going to set the lead for what they should be doing in their localities based on what they're doing across the state. I also work closely with the Virginia State Complete Count Commission that was set up by the governor there. And they are inviting, and today, as a matter of fact, they're having various roundtables across Virginia. And the commissioners, people who have been appointed to their Complete Count Committee, are holding those meetings, educating people about the importance of the census, bringing people together to have that discussion. That's something you may want to consider, having that type of event where you do roundtables across the state to let people know you're involved and that you're willing to work with them. But again, inviting them to be a part of sitting in on these meetings. That's the government sub subcommittee. You also have education. I've talked about that. You have faith based. I've talked about that. During the month of March, what we do every decennial right before the census count is we have faith based leaders give a message every time they're together with their members to talk about the census, the importance of the census. We take the whole month of March every time they're together for them to talk about the census and the count coming up. And we're going to be doing that again, having them do that. They've embraced that greatly and are helping us by getting that message out. So no matter when they're meeting with them during that month, they're going to get the word out. And they'll be doing other things. Media subcommittee, reaching out to media. See, we're going to be doing social media, but we will also be doing that traditional media, print, radio, TV. But we definitely have to engage social media. That's the way it will yesterday and today and in the future. Your, your millennials do nothing but be on social media. If they're watching TV, they're doing Hulu on their computers. Or they have Apple TV, I got it in my house and I don't want it in my house, my daughter uses it. So they use different technology for looking at different things and we have to be able to meet them where they are with this message. So your media, you need to have a media supplement, getting the message out. We are going to be doing some media buy. Can't tell you how much or when or where, but we're going to be buying some space for recruiting and getting messages out with local media. We may not know all of the local media we need to engage in. Minority media. But we need your help and finding out who they are. And we're going to get that information to Anna Lisa, because she's responsible for the media buys in the area. But we need your help in identifying that. So that's what your subcommittee should be doing, helping us with that. Business subcommittee. Business, though, they've never really thought how much they needed to be involved until now. Part of the sense of data, as I mentioned, they know where they can plant and grow their businesses. We're meeting with chambers of commerce to tell them that, how they can use census data. We produce an economic census survey so they can see how businesses, manufacturers are doing over the course of them being in business. How many go out of business within the first two years of business? It's a lot of data we have. We have people from our economic side that would be happy to sit down with business and do a presentation. And we just ask them, they're waiting. But Businesses that have not always engaged in the importance of the census. Yes, businesses like Walmart, Target, big box stores, they have, but sometimes it's the small stores, mom and pop. How they need to grow and do small things. How people are becoming entrepreneurs or consultants in their own businesses, how do they need to spread out? How can they reach people? How do we get that census message out in business? We need your help with that. That is somewhat new to us. We need your help with that. So you need to have a business up. I don't have to worry about Maryland having money to do all of this, but in some places, in some states, we've encouraged them to partner with businesses, but sometimes businesses have the resources and the funding 
be able to do some of the printing and getting the messages out to be able to support the events. In 2010, the Bureau had so much money, they were throwing money at us to be able to get out to our partners. But we were trying to figure out how are we going to do all of these giveaways and promotional items. It's night and day. We don't have that type of funding anymore. We have budget constraints. We have some things we may have, some things we may not have. They are not throwing money at us like they did in 2010. I wish they were. We'll make our job somewhat easy because we have people wearing census t-shirts, carrying census umbrellas, tote bags, all kinds of things. We're not going to have that this time around. So we really need your help in figuring out how do we get the message out without those types of things. This is just the 2020 census phase. We get involved with education. <clears throat> you see the days there. It says 2018 to 2019. We've been involved with education since 2017. I started back with the Bureau in January of 2017. And there were nine of us from partnership team actually out there educating people. We're supposed to have a team of 1,501 partnership specialists across this country. Right now, we're lucky if we have 500. By this time in 2010, decennium, we had 3,000. We are still recruiting. We're going to get to the 1,501, but it's taking us some time. It's a process. But we're going to get there. We're going to have 20 partnership specialists in Virginia. In Maryland, we may have eight in D.C. We're going to get there, but we're working hard at it. But we have to educate, so we've been involved with education a long time now. Awareness, the awareness phase, they say it starts in January, February 2020. No, it starts now, making people aware that the census is coming. Not just in January, we can't wait until January to make them aware. And don't think if we make them aware now that it will die out. Oh, no. Thanks to you, it will, it will always be in front of them. <clears throat> Messages. You talking. I try to be everywhere I possibly can. I haven't learned how to clone myself yet. I'm still trying. On average, I do anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 miles a week driving. Because <clears throat> I enjoy meeting with you and others to talk about the census and the importance of it. But I'm going to begin to slow down because you have been established. And I'm going to count on you being where I have been or should be. Partners and specialists, you'll get to see them face, those faces a lot. A lot. And if you don't, send me an email, give me a phone call. I'll make sure that you get to see those faces a lot. But it's your faces that need to be seen, not ours. So we get into the awareness motivation phase. How do you motivate people to do things? How are you going to motivate them to be captive? We're doing as much as we can. Some of it is by hiring people so they can go and tell their family members, their neighbors, that they need to be counted. But we're going to be getting our messages. Yes, we will have messages through all avenues of media. Yes, we will be doing presentations. That's what these specialists live for, to be up there talking to people, to do one-on-one, -on -one, to, to, to do groups, to develop partnerships to our communities. They enjoy it. Whether they know it or not, they enjoy it. And they're getting better at it. Some of them have only been on board for three months now. Some have been on board for six months. And they're getting better at it. We'll do the motivation thing. We will be getting reminders out, whether it's in the beginning of March, or through March, through April, into May. We will be sending out reminders to people to do their census form. We will send out notices. We haven't received your questionnaire back. Can you send it back to us? We will be sending out a lot of information to make people aware, to motivate them, to educate them, to be counted, and everyone in their family to be counted. So those are the stages. Then we will do a thank you campaign around August, September to thank you for all the work you will have done. Quite a bit of work. We appreciate you standing up. I know some of you will volunteer to do this by someone else. Thank you. <laughs> but we want to say thank you even then. And thank you to your communities. 
We will be tracking census participation in April. We will let you know how communities are doing. We did that in 2010. I'm already cultivating a little friendly competition between Virginia and Maryland. They're complete count commissions. To say, I want to see who gets the highest participation rate. I want to see what, and encourage them to put up whether it's dinners or something else as a prize for who does the best work. I'm from Virginia, so be careful. Yeah, but he stands down, there's no question. She's trying, she's trying diligently. But see, I have history on my side. In 2000, even in the Charlotte region that I used to report to with five states, Virginia was number one. In 2010, Virginia was number one. In 2020, Virginia yeah, had to compete with Maryland because we were in a different region. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I'll be happy with that because that's still part of my legacy. I'm working in Maryland. But we'll see. We'll make you proud. <laughs> yeah, when I retire, I can always say, look at what Maryland did. And I was a part of that. But we're going to develop friendly competitions. And again, tracking participation rates, you will be able to see what's going on within the state and what's going on with other states. Like I said, 2000, Maryland was 74% male participation rate. In 2010, there was 74%. No movement. Some work that has to be done. So again, those are just some of the timelines. <clears throat> I'm going to go through them. Components of a CCC work plan. You need to develop a work plan, create a work plan for what you're going to be doing. One could be meeting monthly. I think it's good to let you meet monthly. Your subcommittees will probably need to meet in between your monthly meetings. Remember, you're a year away. I don't think you can delay any time to really starting to work. So create a work plan, have a vision, mission statement, <laughs> some of the goals you want to accomplish. Spell it out and share it with people. Let it be a mirror for what others can do on a local level. And we'll be happy to share with you anything that's going on with some of the other states that are developing. I will share with you a thing I have as part of this presentation on the website you can go to and see what's going on across the country with other complete count committees. Doing proclamations, letting people know that the state of Maryland is 200% behind getting the best and most accurate count you could possibly get. This December, this goes out. So I talked about thank you. And then make sure you do a final report on everything you've done. A lot of places have not done, did not do a final report for 2010. So they're starting from square one. You don't want the next committee to reinvent the wheel for 2030. And trust me, the Census Bureau has been and is already planning for 2030. Please don't do that to the next committee. Make them start all over. I think they will learn tremendously from you what you leave them with. Some of the effective things we did in 2010, communications. We had an effective communication with public service announcements, advertising campaigns, banners. So we did a lot of different things. Printed materials, faith-based activities. It's up to complete count commissions to do that. We won't have the resources to be able to do that. Some of that, yet yeah, we will do, and as we're doing it, we're gonna get it in your hands to be able to share. But there may be some things your subcommittees are gonna ask you to do that you need to do. And again, use us as a resource for information to know what activities you should be doing to be able to do those activities and to help equip you as much as we possibly can. There's no problem, you will have staffing resources. We will have partnership specialists and myself available. And I have another coordinator who operates out of DC. We'll have another one in Baltimore that will help you every step of the way. But you have to tell us where you need help. We'll share with you where you need to be doing some things, but you need to tell us where you need help. That's why we're here. Identifying the complete count community, I mean, hard to count areas. I'm going to show you in a minute some of the census tracts that might need to be concerned with. 
I know there are a bunch of maps that Audra and the team have put together that show you some of the places, and I know Audra can take you through some of that. Yeah, I just want to mention in your folders, folks, you do have um, predicted low response area maps. Now, when we say predicted, on the census, for instance, let's take a county like Allegheny. On the Census Bureau's um, Rome map may not show up like this, but what we've done is we've enhanced them to give every county an area to focus on so that we want everyone working throughout the state. So these maps are available on the census.maryland.gov uh, website, and they're in your folders. This is, again, not what you'll find on the Census Bureau, but something that we've done to highlight projected areas of low response for each county to use, and, and census tracts, so municipality as well. What is low response? Basically, it's a term we're using in 2010, we called it hard to count areas. And I'll show you some of the hard to count census tracts that are in Maryland in a second. Hard to count areas for a lot of different reasons. No rhyme or reason. Some of them may look the same, but they're not. I'll share with you some of the demographics of these census tracts and the low response score areas. Show you what they are hard to reach, hard to count populations. And as Audra said, these maps and this, the demographic data is only predictors, which means you can change them. They don't have to hold true for 2020. And we say a census tract that has a 25% or greater low response score, you need to target them. Because that means 25% of that census tract population will not fill out a census form. You need to find out why not. And there are some easy answers to it, but you need to target them to do some work. In. This is just quickly an operational timeline, opening area census offices, you know, non-response follow-up. That's when we send the numerators out. Redistricting occurs in April 2020 when we send out, 2021 when we send out the new census data on how populations have changed. But historically, some of the undercounted groups, children under five, age group 18 to 24, veterans, persons with disabilities, immigrants, seniors. We're talking about doing things online for people to fill out the census form. Do we understand how that impacts seniors? I hate texting. I have a problem with texting, and yet I'm learning. In my household, my daughter's on the first floor in our living room watching TV. I'm on the second floor in my office, and she texts me. I yell, what do you want? Stop texting me. Come talk to me. I'm in the same house. She's taught my wife how to text a lot. And she's doing the same thing. We're on different floors, and they're texting. Give me a break. <laughs> You know, I have two phones. One is personal and one is census. From the time I've been here, I can guarantee you I have at least 200 emails that I have to respond to. I can guarantee you that on my census phone. I made the mistake of getting some census employees my personal cell phone. So now they text me and email me on my personal line. I'm going to Sprint next week and changing my phone. <laughs> but that's the age we're in, technology. And we have to understand that and learn how to use it. But I still hate to take it. I'm getting quicker at it, but I still hate it. <laughs> but seniors, seniors, are they into technology? I'm in that class. I hate technology, but I use it quite a bit. But are we setting up opportunities for seniors to have their census forms returned online or by phone or the hard copy? We have to get that message out there that they can do it any of those ways and feel comfortable doing it. Or if they want to do it online, do we have agencies that can help them do it online by getting them in front of a computer? See, that's one of the greatest challenges we have for doing stuff online. Not everybody has access to going online and filling out their census form. And some people may not know how to do it. Connectivity is a big issue for us this time around. 
And we have to address that. That's why we're asking public libraries, workforce development agencies, colleges and universities, if you have a computer lab, can you help us set and arrange time for people to be able to come in to fill out their census form to apply for jobs? We're trying to get that message out also. We need your help doing that. That's what equipment is. <coughs> so we're trying to get that message out. And again, I already talked about children under the age of five. Non-English speakers. We're working with English as a second language program to get the word out about the census and the importance of it. But we don't know where all of them are. And we don't know all of the languages we have to deal with. We're setting up staffing for those needs. But you have to tell us where in the community we have to deal with those particular languages. Where in Maryland? We don't know all of them. And we need to know. We're hiring people that are bilingual buying in a lot of different languages. Is the census form itself going to be in more than one language, more than English? I'm going to let my guru answer that for me. Yes, but I don't know how many exactly off the top of my head. 13. 13 right now is the number, including English. And Arabic, Arabic for the first time. Yeah. See, so the information is already in Maryland. We just have to get it out to everyone. And then we will have a guide that will cover over 50 different languages that people will be able to use to fill out their census. So, yes. And we will have people hired in language. I already have Spanish speaking here in Maryland. I have two. I have one in the D.C. area. I have two in Virginia. And we're hiring. I have Arabic in D.C. And she will get into it. Maryland and Virginia as we need. We will be hiring more. This is not going to have one Arabic partnership specialist. We're hiring Chinese. We're hiring different languages, different skill sets. We need them. They don't have to worry about hiring anyone to cover the senior market. That's me. I'm in that category. So use me. Well, persons with disabilities, working with people in terms of needing Braille forms to be able to fill them out. In 2000 and 2010, we had community-based organizations that put the form in Braille so people can fill them out. And so we're doing different things. We need to let the community know. As I mentioned, LRS scores. This is just some of the variables that go into LRS scores, some of the information. But I want to show you some of them. This is our response outreach area mapper app that will take you to census tracts and show you the low response scores, those hard to count areas that we're predicting may not fill out the form in 2020. <clears throat> Very user friendly app. Census.gov forward slash ROM, R O A M. You'll get a map like this. The darker the color, the more concern you should have. That means those low response percentage scores are high. But again, it's user friendly. I strongly suggest each of you go in, look at it, see what it has to offer. Pick out various census tracts around the state. Let's take a look at some of them real quickly. I'm going to step to the side because I want to read off and just challenge you with some of the stuff you'll be seeing. These are some of the variables or demographics that come up. And this is for Prince George's County. I'm not picking on any counties. I just arbitrarily picked up some of them. So please, don't think I'm picking on Prince George's. But it talks about the total population, which is about 4,200, a little bit over 4,200. Talks about medium income, 67,000. Children under the age of five that may not get counted, 3.19% of that 4,200. It may not seem like a lot, but every one person loss is funding loss to the state. We break it out by 18 to 24, by population 65 and over, 12% predicted not to fill out the census form. We do it poverty level. But let's look at the next series of demographics there. There's some telling points there. Non-Hispanic Black. 
93% of that 4,200 population are predicted not to fill out their census form. 93% of that population black. Think that's a concern? I would hope so. The low response score is 28%. Remember, anything 25% or higher, you need to be concerned with. 93%. Again, I, I just picked them out arbitrarily. I'm not picking them on Prince George's County in this census tract. That's high. So what are you thinking about you're going to do there? Let's look at Baltimore City. Low response score, 31%. And Baltimore City has a robust complete count committee and program. Robust. They are committed to the nth degree. And there's a reason why. Can someone tell me why? Look at those demographics. Ninety percent non-Hispanic black. Because the city recognizes the priority to communicate the census so that those uh, federal funds that support critical programs and services are accessed. Exactly. Exact schools, hospitals. Think about it. Well, you have 90%, close to 2,000 people not filling out a census form. Remember, this is only predictive. It doesn't say it has to hold true. But that's impactful for the state, not just the city of Baltimore. Look at this one, Frederick County. A little bit different demographic, but still very important. Because it's evenly spread out in terms of percentages. Not going to fill out their census form. You have 26% black, you have 26% white, you have 38% Hispanic. Predicted not to fill out their census form for 2020. Washington County. An interesting thing here is 57% of that population of 3,600 white, predicted not to fill out their census form. And this is the information that is contained in that Rome application. You need to look at that to determine what you're going to do. What are the role of partnership specialists? They're your resources. They're your informational people. They will help provide advisory support to you. That's their role and responsibility. Again, don't let them get out of this room without at least talking to them for a minute and getting to know them. They are much more readily available than I am. They are responsible for Maryland. Please get to know them. In summary, you will get a training manual if you don't have it already, a training guide that will take you through a lot of what I have shared with you about what we calculate. Your subcommittee members will need to be trained on their roles and responsibilities, how often they will be meeting. Again, you need to create your work plan on what you're going to be doing and how frequently you're going to be meeting. And begin to talk about how you want to introduce yourself to the media. I know some press release have already gone out, but they need to know what activities you're going to be involved in, how you're going to be reaching out to local communities. Remember again, invite local community complete count committee chairs to your meetings in the future so they can see what's going on statewide, not just in their community. Develop your strategies and activities for engaging, educating, making people aware of and motivating them to respond. And I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Again, we have a bunch of individuals here who can probably answer them better than I can, but any questions that you'd like to ask? Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. Um, can you tell us exactly how many jobs you're planning to hire in Maryland? See, I told you I, that's why I was inviting you, because they were going to ask about jobs. 
Yes, Anna Lisa is responsible for that operation, the side of the operation. Mm -hmm. So she'll be able to share that information. Okay. I don't have the exact number of jobs as yet, of course, because that will be established once we have our final workflows for our non response. Our recruiting goals, however, for the state of Maryland for our peak operations is 36,489. And as a general rule, I would take that 36,000 number and multiply it by 0.4. And that's the amount of jobs. 5.4. We, we recruit approximately six to eight people for every one job that we have to fill. So far about 1,500. It's, it's going to be more than 1,500 in, in peak operations. So we'll probably have 1,500 to 2,000 in each office. We'll probably be looking at close to 10,000 um, overall. I'm sorry, I don't think I, and I'll come to the second question. I don't think I put it in the ACO you we were talking about. No, you didn't. Okay. We will have we will have four um, area census offices with, throughout the state of Maryland. One will be in Hanover, which will be serving Prince George's County, Calvert County, Charles County, St. Mary's, and Anne Arundel counties. The next one will be Hagerstown, serving Western Maryland, everything from Montgomery County and Howard County out towards Garrett County. We will have an independent office in Baltimore City, serving specifically Baltimore City. And then our fourth office is in Towson, which serves Carroll County, Baltimore County, Hartford, Cecil, and all of the Eastern Shore counties. So did I hear Montgomery County? There is not an area census office in Montgomery County. We did have one in 2010. We do not. It will be served by the Hagerstown office. That's very cool. So of every, everything is about That's all of our scary. office counts. Philadelphia region have 36 local <laughs> census offices. In 2010, the Philadelphia region has 36 area census offices for 2020. In 2010, we covered three states in the District of Columbia. We now cover nine states, nine state affairs. Yeah, we went from uh, Census Bureau to add 12 regions. 12 in regions 2010, to six. Down to six. <laughs> yeah, so, you. so I am surprised by that information so I, I do have to say serve having a Hagerstown office serve Montgomery County I think is as, as someone who represents Montgomery County I just think that's very far and I think that's something that we could discuss more offline in terms of the thinking about that but my second question yes. is um, I think it I think the local complete count committees are really important and I, this, I think this is a question um, and maybe discussion for the group. I think something we should really um, figure out is our process of working with the complete count, the local ones. I know one in Montgomery County. I know one in Baltimore City. I don't know if there are other local ones. So I'm curious about if anyone <coughs> knows what other local complete count committees exist. And I just wanted to lift up the, the local work that's happening and um, you know the importance of us just connecting and figuring out how we work together with them. Well, we will make a point of beginning to order to get out to you is the local complete count committees that have been established. Uh, this morning I was in Anne Arundel County and they established one. Uh, just is Anne Arundel? Yes. But we will get you the information. Yeah, and we've been working to identify not only um, the, a census point person in every county, but um, if they have not formed a CCC, we will be encouraging them, providing the training and coordination with the Census Committee, and trying to coordinate with this body as we go forward wherever possible with the local groups. Just a follow-up question to the, and thank you for your question, Kelly, uh, to the, uh, the workforce question. Uh, so when you're talking about peak time, when is that? And so what's your, sort of your timeline for hiring the first operation we're going to have on the ground is going to be our address canvassing operation, which um, that operation will begin for 2020 is a very different picture than what we've done historically. I know in 1990, 2010, our address canvassing was a 100% on the ground. We actually had staff on the streets in every census block around the country doing the housing listing, the check to make sure our address lists were up to date. For 2020, with the use of technology throughout the decade and working with communities throughout the decade, we've lowered that. We will actually only be on the ground in about 40%. 
of the um, census blocks that we need to because the other areas we have discovered that they are stable. We don't need to put boots on the ground to verify something that hasn't changed in 40 years. So that operation is smaller. That's first operation. We will begin our selection and hiring process for that in May of this year. That operation goes to the field in August and will be completed by early October of 2019. At that point, we will begin opening the additional offices around the country, the other ACOs, area census offices. We'll be staffing those offices first and then working into our group quarters operations, our update leave operations, and of course our largest, the peak operations, is our non-response follow-up, which will be, we begin the selection and the hiring and the training and the staffing for that in um, January of next year. Group quarters operation, we begin the selection, training, and hiring on that in November. So once our address canvassing starts and we move to the forthgoing field operations, it's we just sort of cascade until we get to the the big picture on non-response. And you need to know what update leave is all about. And update leave, there are home addresses that do not receive mail delivered to their home, they're delivered to a PO box. We're going to be delivering the form to their homes. It has to go where people are going to get them, get them quickly, and respond. We can't depend on when they're going to get to their PO box to get their mail. And most people think that's a rural type program, but there are a number of city type dwellings that also have PO boxes and don't get their mail delivered to them because of their PO box. We want to ensure we're getting that questionnaire into those offices. Any other questions? Yes, that would work. Who, um, who, does, who has decided on the regions, these different, the counties that are grouped? And uh, now they were, there, it was a delineation process that took place back in 2016. Um, I was heavily involved in that for the Philadelphia region, and it was done on our estimated workloads going into non-response follow-up for 2020. So those regions, the offices were determined to balance workload across the state. And that's actually the way it broke down, which was by Towson. The Towson office and the Hagerstown office have very large geographic areas, but workloads in those areas are equivalent to what we have in Baltimore City because of those low response scores. So the same number of people are essentially hired for each of those offices. And that was part of the delineation process that was done back in 2016. I can, I can answer most of your questions about the delineation because I did the primary delineation for the state of Maryland. And it was looked a little weird to me. <laughs> but, but, it, but it comes out, the numbers, the numbers work. And, and it was, of course, verified then by our upper management as well as census head. Yeah, and if I may, that, I personally, when we saw the originals, I said, you don't need an office in Towson. Um, and, um, and, and that's where we, but they did it, it's, it gets, it's a divide, like dividing the workloads and the population's worth of it. So it was um, definitely a different process from what I can see um, than straight hard to count and focusing on there. There's many other factors that go into it. And um, I think the, the best way they ended up doing it was doing the population for workload. So I recognize and, and certainly um, appreciate your questions. Did the fact of the new way of reporting online go into a factor of where they were located? Or uh, um, it went into factoring what we think the non-response workloads are going to be because we've actually been testing our online response system through the American Community Survey. We started that testing, I think it went live in, I believe, 2004. We started giving that option to people. And we are sort of seeing, of course, increased response rates with the online response more in our metropolitan areas and, of course, less in the more rural areas. So part of the establishment of the centers were based on going after the whole right. town. Right, using yeah. estimates from what we've been getting back from the American Community Survey response, which is actually part of the decennial operation. It's what used to be our long-form 
the census used to have a short form and a long form. We now have a short form and the American Community Survey, which takes place throughout the decade. And we recognize with new technology that some people will be able to use their smartphones, their tablets, and their laptops to fill out the census form. We have what we call an end-to-end -end test uh, in 2018. We did it in Providence County, Rhode Island, where we tested online also, and about 42% of the people responded online. So we looked at that as a good factor that people would respond to online if we gave them that particular option. So that's why we're moving here. We even did some testing in 2010 with about 66,000 people uh, doing it online and had good results. That's why we're moving to this direction. We think it's the way of the future. But we think it is also cost effective rather than hiring 100% of the people to be out on the, on the ground, boots on the ground, whether they're dress canvassing or anything else. Again, we have to recognize that we do have some budget strength, so we have to maximize technology maximize people being able to use the phone and give us the information and still have a hard copy question that's available. How do, yes, how do you handle um, confidentiality with this new digital uh, coin that is going to be happening? Again, most of the information that's coming in will be encrypted and only our people will know how that is encrypted and no one. And we safeguard, I mean, we're testing our system each and every single day. We have the most secure system in the world and we're still testing it. Can I tell you 200% from now through the future that nothing's going to happen to it? No one could, but because we know we're in an age of hacking and people are trying different things, but because of how we've been encrypting stuff, codifying stuff, we are very comfortable that that information is protected. I just want to make a comment if I would. So that's why um, the self-response is critical here in Maryland, because doing the first online census, the federal government has had to build the system, secure the systems, constant monitoring. Um, and so um, it's really going to be critical that we get people to submit their forms themselves rather than count on the enumerators at the end, because we will not have the number of enumerators that were done in 2010. Um, and so the more we recognize that it's imperative part of our messaging is the self-response, the better positioned we're going to be and not rely on the cleanup at the end from the Census Bureau that we may or may not get. And we have to recognize the day and age we're in. A lot more people are using, going online, using computers. Uh, we talk about these millennials a lot, but there are people who are older than millennials who are into technology and filling out information. And again, we think this is an easy way for people to get their information in, as well as the telephone. Um, but we will still, again, have that form available where someone would like to do it by phone. We're using three avenues of people completing their census form to make it easy for whatever one, one they choose. Now, I've been on my bandwagon, my soapbox. I'm going to turn it back over to your coach, as but you still have things on your agenda that you would like to do. now into the future meetings um, or probably touch base a little bit on this strategy how we're gonna go about making this happen I think we just got a lot of ideas that was so helpful um, and so educational at the same time I think um, there was two points that um, resonated to my mind and it was one of the one that you mentioned about um, what are the how are the um, uh, count committees, the, the local ones. How can we get in touch with those? And I think that will make our life way much easier if, as a committee, we can start uh, identifying who they are and how we can probably be a liaison um, or connect with each and every one of them and bring this message that we just got today to bring it over to 
bring it over to them. Um, so that that was one of the, the the main things that came to my head. Get uh, by counties or by cities the list of where they are. Yeah, we'll we'll be able to work with that through through the email and make us. So we'll be able to get a list of. Yeah, so I'm also. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, and then of course the Metropolitan Washington Tag mm -hmm. as their committee that I lined you up with. Yes, we have a regional committee. I think we can put together that list. And then how do we enter officially interact with them? That's the question I have logistically. Well, and we're kind of your liaisons. I mean, we are your liaisons. So Randall, myself, and Emma um, are here to assist with all of that. We want you interacting with the locals and coordinating wherever we can up and down throughout the state. And so that's what the Google Drive that we developed is gonna be good for, because we'll have calendars in there and tracking sheets, and we'll also have um, I'd like to get a back and forth of events going on from this body and, and at the state level, but also so that we know about local events and can coordinate, or if members can go, go, show your support and, and, and be present and talk about We're state about something in MML or makeup. Yes, um, I've already you. taken care of that. Yeah. And we will actually be doing, I have confirmed it with Mako, Natasha, it is, yeah. um, so we're going to do another CCC training at MAKO um, for the summer conference. And so that's all your county folks. And then MML, I believe Tom has not confirmed it with me, but I believe I sold him on it, doing one also at MML for all the jurisdictions, uh, the municipal, I'm, I'm, excuse me, all the municipal folks. So doing CCC trainings at those. So we'll be there not only holding the training, but um, also there to talk to everyone in attendance and get them to know about census and get everyone filled out. And, and to the point as well, um, I just wanted to add in addition to connecting with the ones that exist, encouraging new ones where possible to form. It would be great if the 24 jurisdictions, each, everyone um, had a complete count, local complete count commission. So I think as much as we can, you know, encourage them where they want to, to create them, I think that would be great as well. Yeah, and, and Ron mentioned the meeting at Maryland Nonprofits. That That's something we, all, you know, we also said, you guys should set up CCCs, mm -hmm. um, business groups, and or neighborhood groups, um, HOAs, whatever it may be. But we want everyone setting up a CCC. And one of the things that I've been saying is, you maybe don't know, can I talk about this? Am I somehow a, a, a leader for this effort? Absolutely. You don't need a, a specialized training to get people and raise awareness for census. And we want everyone to feel empowered. So yes, yeah, set up a CCC, but then you are local leaders for us. And we need everyone to be. So everyone can set up a CCC. We encourage it at all levels. Should we create like a PowerPoint, a small one that we can use when we do those presentations? Well, the Census Bureau has a very well-tested, researched, and um, and they're the experts at training those CCCs, which is why we work in partnership with them. And they have, yeah, the Ron's uh, presentation, they have it canned and they can do it for any audience, make it longer or shorter as needed. Mm -hmm. So the partnership the specialists that you see here, they are available to run those trainings for you at any time. And it comes with a full a workbook as well as the slide deck presentation and everything that goes with it. So what's wonderful here is we have really developed an historic uh, partnership with the Census Bureau um, to do that. And so we're working hand in hand with them. So when we need them at events to do these trainings, they're saying, okay, great, Tell, you know, just give me the details and we'll be there. So that's available to all of you as we go forth, that as you have events or there's a CCC um, that you've helped or you know about, then we want to get the Census Bureau there training them so that they feel empowered to be leaders at the local level on census.
is this part of our fourth session? Or so we, you're asking about kind of our calendar. Right, because I really believe that we need to focus on calendar. Four times is going to be a really limited time. So I propose that we get together more often because we need to strategize on how we're going to impact the, the communities. And for that, we need to be all in the same page. We really need to bring the message in the right um, proportion where everybody understands how important it is this to get in action. We cannot wait to the last minute to start running. We really need to have a plan. And I believe if each of us can work out on bringing the ideas to the table and to our next meeting, and we all together, you know, make a whole chronogram on how we're going and where are we going so we can really impact uh, the message into Maryland and make these numbers. If we want, if our mission is really to impact, and right now we have a big goal, and I'm sorry for Virginia, but we got a big goal right now. We need to come number one. So for that, we really need to focus on getting this as fast as possible out and that we can start going over to every event that is right now running in the state of Maryland that we start next week. So we have a big commitment on, on going out and spreading the message and showing that this is start from us. If we don't lead in the right way, unfortunately, the message will not be spread properly. And that's start from us. So I will propose uh, to check the four dates that we're going to get together. And if we can get in the next three to four weeks, that everybody will bring a little piece of this big puzzle. And then we start working from that. But also with the Google document, maybe we should start creating a calendar of events that are happening. Just to share, I know with the commission, the Hispanic commission, we are doing the same and pretty much also the African commission, they said they were gonna support us. So we're gonna be um, uh, putting together a document with events that are happening. And one thing that comes to my mind is what collateral material we're gonna be bringing for those events because we need to be, we need to get those. And also what can we post on our Facebooks and social media um, you know, what can we use to start getting the message out there? I know we got the website um, at the moment. Right? Yes. So we want to, to promote those um, and any other, you know, materials that we can bring up with us. And we are on Twitter at uh, 2020 MD Census. Okay. So we ask you to ask your um, followers to uh, follow the Maryland Census page and, um, Talking points and all of that will be tweeted out, not only from the Census Bureau, but also from our end as well. Do we get any of the committee, do we get any business cards? Or we can use our own business cards? Um, I think that's something certainly not out of the question. Yeah. Okay. How do we want to have committee members um, contact the committee? Should it be through you? Well, one of the difficulties here is we are subject to open meetings. So that means you cannot deliberate over email. And we ask you to be very mindful. That's why we've asked you, if you haven't, to take the open meetings course because, because our, our, our um, conversations and any deliberations are public and need to be done publicly. So that said, uh, one of the easy ways to do this is as our co-chairs develop um, their requests and as you develop your requests, the best way we can foresee handling that is please send um, whatever it may be to, to me or Randall and or Randall. Um, and, and what we'll do is then package it and make sure that as you meet, you have everyone's input or ideas that they've brought to the table. But we just ask you to, to be mindful of open meetings. So the best way to do it is to, to avoid deliberating with three or four or five of you on email, which would be a violation to send it to us. The Google Drive is there for everyone to see everything and upload, and uh, we'll make sure that um, we compile it all, um, double check with you, and so that it's brought to the committee in the format that you've requested. Do we want to do meetings monthly? 
I want to see multiple people do those pictures. Because this person goes to Christ, okay? He goes to the Holy Spirit fasting. If we're looking at having a monthly meeting, um, is there anybody that has any preference beginning of the month, end of the month, middle of the month? Is that the, the issue for anybody in particular? We had first, figure the first week of the month, trying to set something up as, as kind of a schedule to get used to. Just a more notice about the dates of the Certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, does anyone have any date uh, or any day of the week and a time if you have any day of the week and a time or a month please send it to me and that way we i can track it and then it'll help us hone in on okay they can't do it then as you all know being part of these sort of things scheduling is very very challenging uh, when you have two people let alone 10 and staff and the census bureau so um i'd, I'd really appreciate it if you could send me any dates or days or times that you cannot meet so that I can bring everyone recommendations for when we can that works for everyone. And we, you are um, um, free to have designees as needed. We certainly want to keep coordination with our point people, um, but for scheduling purposes, you know, things come up and certainly for all of us um, and our elected officials as well, um, you know, you can designate designees, um, and um, but we hope that that will keep the member, though, also um, we want them to come back when they are available. Um, I think one of our first orders of business may be to define that elevator pitch, simplified message to benefit the uh, obstacle and the opportunity. Um, that way, when we're all out talking or interacting with people, because really, the benefit is it comes out for the money. Uh, the obstacle with people were scared, and we just have to be able to frame a simple, confident message. And uh, I think any way that any of us work it is more important to get going and not worry about having the perfect process. Because as we go forward and we hear input, we'll be able to modify what we do. So uh, it's just really about a broader message, a simple message that resonates with people when you're driving down the road and hear it enough times over the next year. And it's pretty simple. I mean, it's going to be a variation of, um, or subtle, but the, the main points are, are clear. Um, everybody counts, so everybody must be counted. The census is critical to our families, our neighborhoods, and our communities. This is an historic effort from the state of Maryland, uh, from the governor, from the House, from the Senate, to ensure that we increase our participation rates and get Maryland fully counted. I think we go with the number, it's 1,800 bucks a person. We yes, that's what we make sure we get our best benefits, years. SNAP, benefits, 14 years. But you, yeah, right right right. you do want to be mindful, though, that some people say, well, that's just money that I never see. And they don't realize that that money is actually being used to benefit their communities. So those hard to count communities and low response core communities are, in fact, oftentimes communities that are benefiting most from the federal funding that come from census data. So we have to make that 1800 dollars important to them and then that 1800 has meaning three words we're using at the bureau is important easy and safe and within each of those words we have an explanation or a statement it's important yeah because of the money yeah 675 billion dollars and you can break it down to the 800 dollars per person missed we say it's easy because we will be providing free avenues for people to fill out their census form. Never been done like that before. To be able to fill it out online, to be able to call, to be able to mail a form back in. It is safe, and this is probably one of your most critical talking points you need to have, the importance of it being safe, that it is confidential. The information is not shared with anyone outside the Bureau. And you can identify them, ICE, IRS, Social Services, Law Enforcement, that's what I, we get hit with a lot when we are speaking. People want to know how their confidentiality and their privacy is taken. So again, we use important, we use easy, and we use safe. And, that, and that's a great frame. We will move that people come relate to. 
there's, there's, an, there's another dimension in this that, that the U.S. Census Bureau did a, uh, a, a study and they determined that the, the, the issue that resonates most with people is actually not money, but uh, citizenship, uh, act, active engagement. That civic is, duty. Civic yeah. duties, or there is re responsibility. So there's a higher, I mean, there's a transactional issue when that's the dollar issue, but there's also, there's also a, a, a higher call. And that is civic engagement. We tell people it's similar to them voting and jury right. duty. Those are civic duties, you know, uh, that people get engaged in, and they feel committed to doing those things. There's no question the Census Bureau and filling out a census form fits into that category. Also, in terms of civic responsibility. So the slash money would be called community building. Right. One, right. one of our recruiting campaigns that we have out there is actually help your community and join the 2020 census team it's sort of aimed at those people that aren't they don't need a part-time job they don't need money but they're willing to work in and help their community and working for the 2020 census is one way they can do that so just to close that point if i may um the executive order requires the group to meet four times. Um, it's on the table to meet monthly. Is everyone okay with meeting monthly, you or your designee? Okay. Then as I get your chance for scheduling, that'll help me then make recommendations for when our next meetings should be. If we can roughly shoot for first Mondays of the month around 10 o'clock, might Monday's might be because they sometimes holidays. Monday's first Tuesday. Tuesday might be Tuesday. Yeah, Monday could be holiday. Okay. Um, so just just as a rough thing, so how that works for people, and you can respond to Audra about it. That's difficult for you on a particular month. First Tuesday. 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 Yeah. First Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> In that way, we can have in front all the activities coming in that month. If we're missing something, somebody learn about any activity, we can get into together and go in action. I just wanted to ask about the times because I don't think 11 o'clock for me, anyway, is the best because it kind of kills your morning and also kills your afternoon. Right, right. So if we could start at 10 or start at 1 earlier, maybe. The yeah, earlier, the better. Are all the meetings going to be here in Annapolis? <laughs> Undetermined. We have uh, groups, I mean, you all represent various areas of the state. So um, Annapolis is central, um, but I think that it's not, you know, we can certainly have meetings anywhere. We just have to find the space. We have, we have the Crownsville, the Maryland Historical Trust is part of the agency that's in Crownsville. They have two conference rooms downstairs in oh, Crownsville, yeah, sure. 100 community place, which is not too, not too far from here. Still easy for parking, parking, easy yes. for parking also. So, um, I would think the crowds would probably be the alternate location if you find something. This is not going to be available every time. Um, so, yeah, I was thinking this. Crowds will not work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any thought to inviting the local CCCs to one of the future meetings? Good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had thought of a couple of folks from the counties were going to come, but they, they didn't make it here today. So we did extend some of them. Good question. Question, question yeah. slash comment. Since I won't see all of you for another month, I just wanted to throw out um, something else that I'm thinking about is um, I feel very confident in the safety of the census in terms of the encryption and all of those kinds of things. But I think something that we may want to think about in terms of quick, rapid response is that when things like, when something like the census is happening or, you know, look at our, our last election, there's always people who are like trying to scam people and, you know, pretending to be the census. Imagine like a, like a Facebook post or thing where it's like, oh, I'm the, I'm the census, put in your, your social security number and give me your information. So I just think we, we should also, as a complete count commission, be thinking about um, sort of rapid response, thinking about, you know, and being um, vigilant 
around the different scams and things like that that will that are sure to come up around this and i don't know if that's a committee or us just being prepared to get the information out to people about what is the census and official census activities and how making sure that people know the methods of the census will contact them versus you know people who are running scams so i just wanted to put that out there while i was thinking about it if I may just add to that, that's important. Uh, as I'm working with the Virginia Governor's State Complete Count Commission, we have a gentleman sitting on that commission who represents AARP, and that's been one of his biggest concerns, especially as it relates to the senior population. One of the things we're looking to doing, and Annalisa can always chime in as, as I'm talking about it, we're going to make sure, especially local law enforcement knows when we have our census people out in the field, we're going to make sure they have the proper identification shown uh, with their badges, with any other paraphernalia bags that they may be carrying. I think we're also talking about and considering uh, how they can get in touch with the Census Bureau to make sure they can check on the identity of someone who's knocking on their door saying they represent the Census Bureau. So I know those discussions are taking place. I don't know what else we might be doing. And I'll we've be saying that we've done that before. We make sure that um, any enumerator in the field always has the number for the local office that the respondent would be able to call into to verify them and then if they're still uncomfortable with calling in because they don't know they can ask for a call back to verify that that person is a census employee and that would be with the area census office that they're out of and that's, and that's one of the things we're looking at our media contract the national media contract they're helping us craft messages that we can get out there letting them know census people are in your area and this is what you need to look at to identify who they are again the state complete count commission in virginia they're looking at doing media pieces to do the same thing make sure people understand who's knocking who's calling and that is not a, someone trying to per perpetrate a, a scam or fraud and I think one of the ways um, that we can assist people that have concerns for someone coming to their home is again emphasizing the self response. No one will come knock on their door if they have turned in their census form. And so by being proactive, we don't have to be reactive uh, as much um, by having people being concerned about who's knocking or who has ID or who doesn't. I think another important message because of a lot of these scams is to make sure people understand the Census Bureau will never ask for your Social Security yeah. number because mm -hmm. I mean, that's how seniors get called. So I was going to chime in. Our last meeting with the governor's team that came up, we could come up with a list. This, these are questions the Census will never ask. Right? A lot of times that helps more to right? right? So that's a great point. So coming up with a list of questions is something that we and we'll build out our web page to have these sorts of messaging on there so people can verify how are they being approached is this the appropriate approach so you're talking about people that don't know you go to that web page correct so and that's why then report it or please just self submit so all these talking points or FAQs, like that, I'll, I'm assuming they'll be on the Google Drive? Yeah, there's already things in there, including your complete count committee guide. And as we have agreed upon materials that are helpful to you or that you've asked for and we've developed, that will go there. And also on the website as well. Is there branding in there? Yes. And the website has, this is our official logo. The website already has the logo on there for everyone to download and use. This is our branded logo that we want everyone using and pushing out. And as we communicate with, for instance, county governments, um, Pat, we, we, this is the kind of thing that we want them putting on any materials. We're talking to our colleagues in state agencies as they have procurements coming up and they're running printing. We want our logo on there so that people understand, they see it, we, we, we raise awareness and, and get the critical mass to getting people to yes. If there's anybody who's interested in serving, chairing, or seeing created a, a subcommittee, um, you can just let Audra or Randall know that also. If you want to serve, chair, or see one created, we're contemplating how to get those together. So. If you want to be a part of that, please let us know. 
Are there pre-canned like social media posts or anything like that that we can sort of schedule out? And oh, we'll be developing those. There, we don't have them at this time. And is there a you know a uniform hashtag? Yes. Twenty twenty MD census, which is on the back of your photo. That'll be the hashtag for Facebook as well as the Twitter handle. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Just part of our wrap up. We have this big giant counter, 365 days. We have this. It didn't oh. work until we figured out the system. Okay. This is our logo. The 29 days work. Okay. I won't be very dramatic. I'm just going to take a look at this. Okay. So it's a leap year. So we're going to have an extra day. Exactly where we went. I know exactly what we need to know. They won't know our names. Um, 
-hmm. They'll know exactly who comes on. That's my point. As the Secretary of Planning, I would support this committee. I support the efforts of everyone in the state. I support the complete testing of for all. They're going to be popping up all over the place. I'm a little bit worried about census fatigue, but I'm telling you, that's a big problem. That's a good problem to have. They hear our message, and they hear the message from somebody else, they hear the message from somebody else. I'm okay with that. One of those voices will be more trusted than the other. We can hear it and we trust our voice. So I'm committed to supporting this as much as we possibly can. I see the power of the data we already have. I see the power of how that can change people's lives. I see the power of how that can change business decisions. I see the power of how that can change things. So I want us to have the most accurate count ever and the highest response. Thank you for being here. I appreciate Mr. Brown being here. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. I can't thank you enough for taking the responsibility. And you will have as much administrative support as you can possibly give me. And everybody else who's here on behalf of the organization, um, if you have a question, if you have something that you need done, if you can't get a hold of Audra Randall, then you contact me and I'll do what I can. I can't promise you the answer.